الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, we are continuing our explanation of one of the most uh, fundamental and famous primers or beginning books of fiqh in the Hanbali Madhab and that is Al-Umda by Ibn Qudama Al-Maqdisi and we are doing the Kitab of Salah we skipped over Tahara because as for those of you who didn't attend our last week I have done Tahara last year uh, in much more detail. So we're going to now start with the, today we're going to do Babu Shurut Salah or the chapter regarding the Shart or the Shurut of Salah. And the Shurut, uh, the meaning of Shart is a precondition. And what this means is that in order for any action to be accepted, before you begin the action, you have to have the Shurut done. So this is a checklist before you begin. If you don't have the checks marked on this checklist, you cannot begin. Therefore, every action, or I should say almost every action, has certain shurut. It has certain uh, preconditions. And the difference between a shart and a rukun, we're going to come to rukun in a while, in a few weeks, two weeks maybe, is that the rukun is inside the action, whereas a shart is before the action. So a rukun, or the arkan we're going to do, and the wajibat, these are inside of the action. And the sunan, these are inside of the action. As for the shard, this is before the beginning of the action. So we begin by talking about the preconditions of salah. And in order for salah to be accepted, all of these conditions have to be marked or otherwise excused. So you either have a legitimate excuse, in which case it is forgiven, or all of these have to be marked. And he said, وَهِيَ sitta." There are six uh, conditions. And by the way, for those of you that are also learning in the Arabic class, we're having at MIC, this is also a good time to follow along with me because I will be reading as I did last week. I read the metan in Arabic and then we uh, translate it as well. Ahaduha, uh, The first of these six. الطَّهَارَةُ مِنَ الْحَدَثِ To be pure from hadath. And hadath is defined to be spiritual impurity. In contrast to najas, which is physical impurity. So there's two types of impurities. There's the physical impurity, such as urine and stool and these. This is physical impurity. This is najasa. We'll get to that in another shart. But hadath is spiritual impurity. And the sharia has decided or has told us what are the conditions for raising the hadath or the spiritual impurity and that is of course done via ghusl and or wudu. So this is not a physical impurity. Hadath, when you do wudu, nothing has changed on your outside. Okay. In fact, you could be absolutely clean and the wudu will not clean you any more than you were before wudu. But before you, you might have been clean from another method, but now after wudu, you will be clean from taharat al-hadath. So the hadath will be lifted off from you. So hadath over here means spiritual impurity. And of course, uh, we all know and we have done already last year the issue of tahara and how wudu is done and when wudu is done. All of this was discussed before. So of the conditions of salah, al-tahara to min al-hadath. How do you become tahir from hadath? So we have two primary ways and that is the uh, physical way of doing it which is ghusl or wudu. And then there is the symbolic way of doing it in the absence of water or when you are sick, then you will become tahir from hadath through the symbolic method. And the symbolic method is what? Tayammum. Okay. So a tahara min al-hadath is done from one of two ways. If you are healthy and normal and you have water available, tahara min al-hadath must be done via, via wudu. Right, And we already discussed last year, if you do ghusl, does it count as wudu? We talked about the controversy and the madahib, what they said in last year's class. Uh, for, from the perspective of this class, let's just say, if you had done ghusl with the niyyah of ghusl, then it counts as wudu as well. And that's the position I uh, defended last year and uh, when we did the fiqh of wudu. And inshallah, it is the correct opinion. Nonetheless, if you want to follow the other opinion and do a wudu, 
after you do ghusl, this too is ja'iz and it is better, it is good. And in fact, when the Prophet did ghusl, he would do a wudu inside of the ghusl. So he would literally do a full wudu as he's doing the ghusl. And this is the perfection of the sunnah, that the ghusl should incorporate a wudu inside of it. And therefore, even when we are in our times, we're taking a shower, in the process and would use a cup or a, a, a small bucket, we have the shower, it is still sunnah for us to do a wudu, even as the water is running on us, just to follow the sunnah of the Prophet we do a wudu because he would do wudu while he's doing ghusl. But in case we didn't do wudu and we had the niyyah for ghusl and we followed the, the shuruth of wudu, ghusl, the arkan of ghusl, which I talked about last time, then we will be considered tahir min al-hadath i.e. when we walk out of the shower, then we can pray. So this shart, the first of the six, is by unanimous consensus. There is no ikhtilaf. No madhab in the world, no scholar in the world has allowed a salah without tahara min al-hadath. You have to have tahir. You have to be tahir min al-hadath by one of two ways. The physical or at least the symbolic. And the symbolic, which means literally if there's no water, you will still have to do something to become tahir. And we talked about last time what we do, the, the tayammum, how we do that. That is already done from last, uh, last class. So the first condition, at-taharatu min al-hadath, by unanimous consensus. And the strongest evidence in fiqh is unanimous consensus. In fact, some say it is even stronger than the Qur'an. How so? Why so? Because the Qur'an can be interpreted in so many ways. So many verses can be interpreted two, three, four ways. So when a scholar says by unanimous consensus this is allowed or this is forbidden, this is the strongest evidence. Khalas, you don't even need to discuss it. Because there is no scholarly difference of opinion. This is one of those things. That in order to, ha- to pray, you must basically be in the state of tahara. Okay? Uh, and technically we should say you must be in the state of tahara. You shouldn't say we must have wudu. Because tayammum is not wudu. So the technical terminology, that's why he has it, at-taharatu min al-hadath. He didn't say you have to do wudu, because sometimes you don't have to do wudu. We talked about that, tayammum or you're sick. So the technical definition of, of the first condition is that you must be tahir from hadith. What is the evidence from this in the sunnah? Uh, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لِقَوْلِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ لَا صَلَاةَ لِمَنْ أَحْدَثَ حَتَّى يَتَوَضَّ لا صلاة لمن أحدث حتى يتوضأ. And this hadith is reported in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim with various wordings. In one wording, لا يقبل الله أحدكم إذا أحدث حتى يتوضأ. Allah will not accept the salah of any amongst you once he breaks his wudu until he does wudu. لا صلاة لمن أحدث and hadith here means to break the wudu by urine, by defecation, by breaking wind, whatever breaks the wudu. This is called hadith. And that's why at taharam al hadith is rev- raising the uh, hadith, uh, which he becomes tahir, hatta yatawadda, until he does wudu. So, unanimous consensus, very easy precondition, all the madahib agree. Athani, a shart athani al waqtu. A shart athani al waqt. The second precondition is time. The time has to be met. The time has to be met. And the timing is a necessary precondition. You cannot pray a prayer until its time comes in. This is by also by unanimous consensus. Right now is not the time for Isha. If somebody were to pray Isha without a valid excuse, i.e. a Musafir, maybe it will be allowed. But for the one who's not Musafir, it doesn't matter. He has to pray Isha over again because the shalt was not met. The shart was not met. And therefore, even if accidentally a person prayed, thinking it was Isha time, then it became clear that it is not Isha time. That salah will not be counted. Just like if he prayed completely the whole salah, then he remembered, oh, I didn't have wudu. Well, tough luck, that's a shart. You're going to have to pray from the very beginning. And the same applies for the timing. That if it was mistaken, even it doesn't matter, you will have to pray from the very beginning. And that is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ كَانَتْ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ كِتَابًا مَوْقُوتًا Surah An-Nisa, Allah says that the prayer has been ordained at specific times for the believers. إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ كَانَتْ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ كِتَابًا مَوْقُوتًا مَوْقُوت, the waqt. Mawqut, it has been particular waqt. So by explicit testimony of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the prayer has a specific timing. What are these timings? There are two primary ahadith that are used to derive the timings. 
two primary ahadith that are used to derive the timings. The first of them is the hadith of Abdullah ibn al-Amr ibn al-As, which is muttafaq alayh, Bukhari and Muslim. Uh, and the second of them is called the hadith of Jibreel. Uh, and this is the other hadith of Jibreel, not the famous hadith of Jibreel, not the hadith of Jibreel that a man came wearing white clothes and white turban and black beard. No, that, that's the other famous hadith of Islam, Iman Ihsan. There is another hadith of Jibreel and I will summarize it for you right now. So the two primary a hadith upon which the salah timings are based are number one, the hadith of Abdullah ibn al-Amr ibn al-As. And he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَقْتُ الظُّهْرِ إِذَا زَالَتِ الشَّمْسُ وَكَانَ ظِلُّ الرَّجُلِ كَطُولِهِ مَا لَمْ يَحْضُرْ وَقْتُ الْعَصْرِ The timing of dhuhr is when the sun begins to zawal. إِذَا زَالَتِ الشَّمْسُ The timing of dhuhr is when the zawal begins. And until the shadow of a man is equivalent to his length. And it will last until the time of Asr. And the time of Asr, وَوَقْتُ الْعَصْرِ مَا لَمْ تَصْفَرُّ الشَّمْسِ The timing of Asr is up until when the sun becomes yellowish and dull. وَوَقْتُ صَلَاةِ الْمَغْرِبِ مَا لَمْ يَغِبِ الشَّفَقِ And the timing for Maghrib is until the shafaq disappears. And for now, just write shafaq, and then we'll translate later on what is the meaning of shafaq. The timing for maghrib is as long as the sun does not shafaq. The shafaq does not disappear. وَوَقْتُ صَلَاةِ الْعِشَاءِ إِلَى نِصْفِ اللَّيْلِ And the timing of isha is until the middle of the night. إِلَى نِصْفِ اللَّيْلِ وَوَقْتُ صَلَاةِ الصُّبْحِ And the timing of fajr. مِنْ طُلُوعِ الْفَجْرِ مَا لَمْ تَطْلُعِ الشَّمْسِ is from the crack of dawn until the sun rises, as long as the sun does not rise. Now this hadith is obviously famous because it is so explicit and it goes over all five prayers. The timing of dhuhr is when the sun begins the zawal until the shadow is equivalent to the length of the man and the timing of asr begins. The, waqt, the asr timing is until the sun becomes yellowish. The Maghrib timing is until the Shafaq disappears. The Isha is until the middle of the night. And the Fajr is from Tulu' al-Fajr, Salat al-Subh. He said the morning prayer is from the beginning of the sunrise, the, da the dawn basically, until the sun actually rises above the horizons. This is the famous hadith of Abdullah ibn al-Amr. Uh, Abdullah ibn Abdul ibn Al-As. The other hadith is the hadith of Jibreel, uh, is the famous hadith of Jibreel, in which Ibn Abbas narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to the Sahaba, Jibreel led me in salah two days in a row. Jibreel led me in salah two days in a row. So the first day, then the hadith goes on, the beginning of each of the five salawats. Then the second day, and the hadith goes on, the end time of every salah. Then Jibreel said to me, the waqt of each of the salah, ma bayna hadhain, is in between these two. Okay? So this hadith occurred in Mecca, very early on. When salah first became wajib, which is after Isra wal Mi'raj. Okay? After Isra wal Mi'raj, when the five salah became wajib. So according to the traditions, Jibreel came the next day. And he was the one who led the Prophet as the imam. To show him how to pray and to explain the timings of the salah. And the first day, he started at a particular timing. Then the second day, he started at a much later timing. And then he said, وَقْتُ الصَّلَاتَيْنِ مَا بَيْنَ هَذَيْنِ وَهَذَا Between these two is the timing of the salah for your ummah. Now, there is some ikhtilaf between the hadith of Jibreel and the hadith of Abdullah ibn Amr al-As. And from this, some of the madhahib have also differed. Okay, it's not exactly the same. And we'll talk a little bit about this, but as I said from the beginning, the purpose of this class is not to go into all the madhahib. It's simply to go over one madhab. So let us begin with what Ibn Qudama says in his book, Al-Umda. That, Al-Waqtu, wa waqtu dhuhri min zawal al-shamsi ila an yasira dhillu kulli shay'in mithlahu. And the timing of dhuhr begins from the zawal of the sun. And the zawal is considered to be when the sun begins its descent. When the sun begins its descent after having reached the highest point in the 
horizons. And this is something that every single person knows that as the sun rises up, so your shadow will decrease, decrease, decrease until a point will come that it is the bare minimum. Now, uh, most of us don't really pay attention and we don't look at this that clearly. Uh, many, have, many have a simplistic notion that the time will come when the sun is directly above us and we have no shadow. In fact, this only occurs on one or two days of the year at particular places on earth. Otherwise, for the bulk of us, for every single day, the sun never uh, is directly over our heads. That doesn't happen on a daily basis. It's a very irregular thing twice a year and in some places of the year. Otherwise, every single day, you will have a little bit of shadow. So your shadow will, after Fajr, will be very long. Then as the sun is rising, your shadow will get shorter, 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 shorter. Then it will be maybe half a foot. Then it will begin to grow again. Okay, so the shadow never disappears or it disappears, as I said, twice a year uh, in most locations. Otherwise, from most of the year, it will go down to a minimum. The moment it goes down to the minimum, then it begins to increase. That is the beginning of Dhuhr. That is the beginning of Dhuhr, and this is by unanimous consensus. All the madahib, no ikhtilaf. Zero difference of opinion, clear cut, everybody agrees, that's the beginning of Dhuhr timing. And the end of Dhuhr timing is إِلَىٰ أَنْ يَصِيرَ ظِلُّ كُلِّ شَيْنْ مِثْلَهُ When an object and its shadow are exactly equal. When an object and its shadow are exactly equal. And this is the position of the Hanbali school and the Shafi'i school and the Maliki school. Who is left? The Hanafis. The Hanafis have another opinion. And the Hanafis say that Dhuhr is until the sun reaches twice its length. Dhuhr is until the sun reaches twice its length. And in fact, they have some ambiguous evidence, but they don't have anything explicit. Whereas both Hadith of Jibreel and Hadith of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As clearly say the waqt of Dhuhr is until the sun reaches its shadow, when an object reaches its shadow in length. So we have explicit a hadith, and therefore, uh, and we're doing the Hanbali Madam anyway, so we will go by this, uh, by this uh, ruling. So, Dhuhr begins when the Zawal begins, and ends when a one meter stick will have a one meter shadow. Okay, a two meter stick will have a two meter shadow, that is when the timing of Dhuhr begins. وَوَقْتُ الْعَصْرِ وَهِيَ الْوُسْطَى مِنْ آخِرِ وَقْتِ الظُّهْرِ And the timing of Asr, and the timing of Asr, and it is Al-Wusta. What does it mean, and it is Al-Wusta? This is a fiqhi tafsir. Allah says in the Quran, حَافِذُوا عَلَى الصَّلَوَاتِ وَالصَّلَاةِ الْوُسْطَى Which is the Salat Al-Wusta? So the Hanbalis and the, uh, the Hanbalis and the uh, Hanafis, here they agree. And they say the Asr is the Wusta. And the Shafi'is and the Malikis, they say, Fajr is the Wusta. So they have a fiqhi ikhtilaf in tafsir. Now, what difference does it make in fiqh? Nothing. So why the difference of opinion? Or what's the issue of the difference of opinion? So clearly, one of the salawat, Allah is saying, be careful especially about it. حَافِظُوا عَلَى الصَّلَوَاتِ وَالصَّلَاةِ الْوُسْطَى Guard all of the salah and especially the wusta salah. Which one is the wusta salah? So the Hanbalis and the Hanafi say Asr is the wusta salah. Just to emphasize it more. And no, the Hanbalis, the Hanbalis and the Hanafis. The Malikis and the Shafi'is, they say wusta is Fajr salah. Now, the blessings of Fajr are plenty. But it appears that a hadith seemed to mention that wusta is Asr. And perhaps the reason why is that Asr is one of the most difficult salah for the busy person. And even us in our routines, Asr is an awkward salah between work and getting home, let's say. Okay? It's something that is difficult to do towards the end of the day. And unfortunately, many of us delay it or we pray it at a time we should not pray. So perhaps this is why Salat al wusta and our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that whoever does not pray Asr, it is as if all of his good deeds have been destroyed. فَقَدْ حَبِطَ عَمَلُهُ 
whoever does not pray Asr, then all of his good deeds are destroyed, meaning there's no point in doing anything else. So in any case, he brings in a tafsir of an ayah because the madhahib even differed, which is wusta. So the hanbali madhab is that wusta is Asr. So, وَوَقْتُ الْعَصْرِ وَهِيَ الْوُسْطَى مِنْ آخِرِ وَقْتِ الظُّهْرِ And the salah of Asr, which is the wusta salah, begins from the end timing of dhuhr. مِنْ آخِرِ وَقْتِ الظُّهْرِ Now this is another fiqhi issue. That the, ham, the Hanbali Madhab says that the ending of dhuhr is the beginning of Asr. And this is the majority opinion when one salah ends the other salah. There are some madhahib, I'm not going to confuse you, so we're not going to go into all the, There are some madhahib, they say that there is an overlap. There is an interim frame where two people can stand up in the exact same time frame. And the one is praying dhuhr, the other is praying asr, and their both salah is fully jaiz. And this is an ikhtilaf because when exactly does the next salah begin? Is there a clear-cut demarcation, watertight, or is there a bit of a leeway such that one begins the other? So in reality, there's a difference of like four or five minutes. It's a difference of just a little bit. And the fact of the matter is that this is, in my opinion, a philosophical issue that has very little fiqh relevance because in the end of the day, how are you going to measure exactly? Well, these days we have scientific measurements, but if you didn't have a scientific measurement, right? How are you going to exactly measure it's one meter to the, to the millimeter, right? So Allah knows best. Yani the point is, yani majority say when dhuhr finishes, at that minute, asr begins. And there's a minority position. One of the madahib says, dhuhr and asr and maghrib and isha, they have an overlapping time. And, you know, this is just a philosophical ikhtilaf. In the end of the day, the, the madhab we're studying says, the end of one marks the beginning of the other. So it's a clean cut. The end of one. So that's why he said, min akhri waqt al-dhuhr. It begins from the end time of uh, dhuhr. Ila an tasfarra shams Until the sun becomes dull and yellow. Ila an tasfarra shams Now, this phrase, tasfarra shams it occurs in the hadith of Abdullah ibn Amr that I just quoted you. And I'll quote you again. وَوَقْتُ الْعَصْرِ مَا لَمْ تَصْفَرَّ الشَّمْسِ The timing of Asr is as long as the sun does not become yellow. However, the other hadith of Jibreel has a different wording. And that wording is وَصَلَّ بِيَ الْعَصْرِ حِينَ, حين صَارَ ظِلُّ كل شيء مثله. And he prayed Asr when the shadow of every object became double its length. This is on the second day, not the first day. So on the first day, Jibreel prayed when the shadow was equivalent to its length, which is also what the hadith of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Amr says. On the second day, the hadith of Abdullah ibn Amr says, and, he, and uh, the timing of Asr is until the sun becomes yellow. And the hadith of Jibreel says, the timing of Asr is when the shadow becomes double its length. Now, what is the difference between these two timings? It's difficult to say. But one could say that the sun becoming yellow occurs before the shadow becomes double. So the sun becoming yellow means you can look at it. It doesn't hurt your eyes. There's no heat coming from it. It's not a precise timing, by the way. It's a vague timing. And the shadow being double its length, you can measure it. And it's a precise timing. So... The Hanbali Madhab basically says that Asr time is up until uh, the sun becomes yellow and within the Hanbali Madhab you also find until the shadow equals double its length. And both of these timings are somewhat similar. It's not a big difference between the two. Okay, So Asr timing lasts until uh, either the sun becomes yellow or the, sun, uh, or the shadow becomes double its, its length. ثُمَّ يَذْهَبُ وَقْتَ الْإِخْتِيَارِ وَيَبْقَى وَقْتُ الضَّرُورَةِ إِلَى غُرُوبِ الشَّمْسِ Then, he says, the preferred timing vanishes and the, the time of necessity remains up until sunset. So, this shows us that Asr has two time frames to it. Unlike Dhuhr, where there was one time frame. Asr has two time frames to it. And by the way, all the books of fiqh begin salah timings with dhuhr, not with fajr. You would think with fajr, but they don't. All the books of fiqh 
the first salah is waqt al-dhuhr. Why? Because of the hadith of Jibreel and the hadith of Abdullah ibn, As- ibn As. That both of them, the process began, he prayed dhuhr. And then he prayed asr. And then maghrib, then isha, and then fajr. So because of this, and just to follow the sunnah of the Prophet all the books of fiqh began their salah timings with dhuhr salah. And even this book does as well. So we now learn that asr salah has two timings. Waqtul ikhtiyar and waqtul darura. Okay? What is the waqtul ikhtiyar? The waqtul ikhtiyar is from when the shadow is one to when the shadow is two. Or we can say when the shadow is one till when the sun becomes yellowish. And we said we use both of these, they're interchangeable. Is this clear or am I losing any of you? This is waqtul ikhtiyar. What does waqtul ikhtiyar mean? You have the choice. And if you delay till the very end, you are not sinful. For no reason. For no valid reason. You just delay. You're just sitting and watching TV and you just want to finish the episode. You're not going to be sinful. You might be sinful for watching the TV. That's something else. We're not talking about that. right? But you're not going to be sinful for delaying the asr up until the sun is double its length. It is legitimate. Ikhtiyar. You have the choice. But if you delay beyond that, you have to have a darura. Otherwise, you are sinful. What is a darura? A darura means you have some reason for which you are excused. You are stuck in traffic. Okay? Now, here is the point. If you are stuck in traffic and you can pull over and your maghrib time is about to come in and you haven't prayed asr, you have to pray asr. But if you're stuck in traffic and you'll get home before maghrib time, but you will move on to the waqt al-darura, okay? This might be a legitimate reason that, you know, it is highly inconvenient for me. It's not impossible, right? And your salah will not get the full reward, but still you will be counted as having prayed asr. So you'll get down a grade. In other words, waqt al-darura means there must be what is called a pressing need, not a life and death need. A life and death need, you can delay the salah, obviously, right? A life and death need, that's not something that we are talking about in any of the salawat. We're talking about a pressing need, a need that is extremely difficult to get out of, but not impossible. In this case, you may delay it to waqt al-darura. And waqt al-darura, what is waqt al-darura of asr? Ila ghurub al-shams. Until the sun sets. Until the sun sets. So there is around in the summer months, probably 30, 40 minutes. And in the winter months, probably 10 minutes or 15 minutes or less. Of timing that you should not pray dhuhr, uh, sorry, asr in. And if you pray asr in that timing without a legitimate reason, your reward will be diminished. In fact, you might incur a type of sin. The Hanafis will say your salah is makru. But this terminology is not used by the other madahib. Okay? But the Hanafis will say your salah is makru. That is makru to pray at that time. But the other madahib don't use this terminology because salah cannot be makru. But you have delayed it to a timing where the timing itself is makru. That's what the other madahib would say. That you have delayed it and there might be a sin in the delay unless there was a legitimate reason. So we learned that dhuhr has only one timing. Asr has two timings. Waqt al-ikhtiyar and waqt al-darura. And we said that uh, the, the Hanafis are the only madhab that has a different distinction. And they don't have this terminology of uh, until the sun becomes yellow. وَوَقْتُ الْمَغْرِبِ And the timing of Maghrib. مِنَ الْغُرُوبِ إِلَىٰ أَنْ يَغِيبَ الشَّفَقُ الْأَحْمَرِ And the timing of Maghrib is from the time that the sun sets. Oh, you don't have it over here, Minal Ghurub. So my textbook has Minal Ghurub. And by the way, this leads me to another technical point. Sometimes printings have differences depending on the manuscripts. So the book, the printing that I am using uh, is different than your handout because I gave you a translation. And I have one of the, the better printings of the book. And this printing, وَوَقْتُ maghribi مِنَ الْغُرُوبِ Over here, وَوَقْتُ maghribi إِلَىٰ أَنْ يَغِيب. So it doesn't say Minal al ghurub It doesn't say from sunset. But it is a trivial difference because the beginning time of Maghrib is unanimously agreed upon by all of the madahib. No difference of opinion. 
the beginning of Maghrib timing is unanimously agreed upon. So it doesn't really matter whether it's found in the text or not. There is no ikhtilaf over this matter. The beginning of Maghrib is when the sun sets. And the sun sets means that the last disk of the sun has disappeared over the horizon. This is the meaning of sunset. When the last disk of the sun disappears over the horizon. And by horizon we mean the flat line. And in case the horizon is not flat, then you estimate the flat line. And therefore, if you are in the desert and in the distance where the sun is setting is a mountain, and the sun sets beneath the mountain, this is not going to be sunset. This is not going to be sunset. You have to imagine sea level. And when the sun sets beneath the sea level, that is the beginning of Maghrib. In case you cannot see that sea level, which is the majority of times you are in this planet Earth, very rarely will you get the flat horizon. In case you cannot, you have to estimate when that little bit will go beyond the, uh, beyond the sea level. That will be the Maghrib al-Shams. So the beginning of Maghrib is from the Ghurub until a shafaq al-Ahmar disappears. What is a shafaq al-Ahmar? A shafaq is the twilight. A shafaq is the twilight. So when the sun sets immediately, it is still very bright. It is actually very bright. Even today, if you were, even tomorrow, notice that when the timing for Maghrib comes in, sometimes you think, no, it can't be Maghrib, it's too bright outside. Because it looks as if the sun is still there. And if you were to walk outside, well, not here because of the, the electric light, but if we were in the middle of the, uh, the desert or the middle of the, uh, the nature without any lights around us, you will imagine, just imagine, you will see the glow of the horizon become dimmer and dimmer and dimmer, okay? Until the reddish orangish tinge disappears. That is a shafaq al-ahmar. That is the cutoff of Maghrib for the Hanbalis and the Shafi'is and the Malikis. That is the cutoff of Maghrib. Who's left? Hanafis. The Hanafis typically have different uh, reason, different uh, rulings. So out of the three, out of the four madahib, usually you'll find the three on one side and the Hanafis on the other for reasons beyond the scope of this class. Uh, but that's a common uh, theme throughout. For the Hanafis, for the Hanafis, when does Maghrib finish? The Hanafis say Maghrib finishes when the whitish twilight disappears, not the reddish. A shafaq al abyad for the Hanafis. A shafaq al abyad And the whitish twilight disappears after the reddish twilight by 10 15 minutes, depending on the time of the year. Okay? So the Hanafis have a longer time frame for, for which salah? For Maghrib salah. The Hanafis have a longer timing for the Maghrib uh, salah. Now, where does this come from? What is the ikhtilaf based on? Why do the Hanafis say white and the others say red? This goes back to the linguistic meaning of the word shafaq. Because in the hadith that I just quoted you, وَوَقْتُ صَلَاةِ الْمَغْرِبِ مَا لَمْ يَغِبِ الشَّفَقْ The timing of maghrib is until the shafaq disappears. This is the hadith. Hadith is in Bukhari Muslim, Sahih Muslim, explicit, authentic hadith. So what is the shafaq? The Hanbalis and Shafi'is and Malikis all defined shafaq to be the reddish twilight. And the Hanafis define Shafaq to be the whitish twilight. So based on interpreting language, the Madahib disagreed. And this shows us, the reason I'm saying this, to show you why do the Madahib disagree? Why is it that these all of these ikhtilaf appears? Well, sometimes it's because they took different hadith. Sometimes it's because one hadith didn't reach the imam. Sometimes it's because this and that. And sometimes it's simply because what does this word mean? So the word shafaq, what does it mean in the Arabic language? This has nothing to do with Quran, hadith, fiqh. It has to do with lugha. So the ikhtilaf in the madahib goes back to the ikhtilaf in the lugha. You guys following or am I using too much Arabic for you? You guys following, right? What is the definition of shafaq? And the, now we get into pre-Islamic poetry. Because that's how language and meaning is derived. We get into lexicons. We get into what early Arabs said. And... Uh, the stronger position clearly from pre-Islamic poetry, by the way, is the shafaq is the reddish, redness of the sky. So when the redness disappears, that is when Salat al-Maghrib finishes. Now, in the hadith of Jibreel that we quoted, the Prophet said, and he prayed Maghrib with me on the second day 
the exact same timing as the first day when the sun went down. And the hadith of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, we just quoted you, and the timing of Maghrib is up until when the shafaq disappears. So this is the biggest ikhtilaf between these two hadith. In that, in the second hadith, which is Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, we get two timings. And in the first hadith, Jabili, we get one timing. From this, you get two opinions. One position is that, and this is the predominant Shafi'i opinion, by the way, is that Fajr really only has one timing. Sorry, Maghrib really only has one timing. There are no two timings. You just have to pray at that time. And the other madhahib say that Maghrib, because the timing is so short, so Jibreel led him in both days on the same, but technically Maghrib has longer time. And this is the majority position about Maghrib. And this is the position that our Ummah has adopted. That the one Salah that you're the most conscious about in terms of timing is what? Is Maghrib. Okay, because it's the shortest time. And this is the interpretation that the other Madahib have of the Hadith of Jibreel. Why did Jibreel radiallahu, uh, uh, salam, lead the Prophet in the same timing both days? To demonstrate, make sure you don't miss Maghrib. Not to indicate that Maghrib does not have a later timing. And we know this because of this hadith of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Aus. He clearly said that وَوَقْتُ صَلَاةِ الْمَغْرِبِ مَا لَمْ يَغِبْ الشَّفَقِ That until the shafaq disappears, you may pray uh, maghrib. So this is the maghrib uh, timing. And, uh, and it is authentically narrated as well that in one uh, hadith, the Prophet ﷺ delayed maghrib. فَأَخَّرَ الْمَغْرِبَ إِلَىٰ قُبَيْلِ أَنْ يَغِيبَ الشَّفَقِ And he delayed Maghrib, the hadith is in Tirmidhi, until the shafaq almost disappeared for a reason that was happening. So he delayed Maghrib, the Prophet ﷺ, until the shafaq almost disappeared. So this clearly demonstrates, therefore, that Maghrib does indeed have two uh, timings. Okay, So this is the timing of Maghrib. And we now get to Isha. وَوَقْتُ الْعِشَى And the timing of Isha. وَوَقْتُ الْعِشَى and the timing of Isha, min thalika, is from that time. From what time? From the Shafaq ending. That time is the ending of Shafaq. Ila nisfil layl. Until the middle of the night. Ila nisfil layl. Thumma yabqa waqtu al-darurati ila tulu' al-fajr al-thani. Then remains the timing of darura until the second fajr timing. What is the second Fajr timing? Tulu' al-Fajr al-Thani. Tulu' al-Fajr al-Thani. There's al-Fajr al-Awwal and al-Fajr al-Thani. Okay? Al-Fajr al-Sadiq and al-Fajr al-Kathib is also called. Okay? Al-Fajr al-Awwal is... So imagine you're in the middle of the desert. It's 3 a.m. Imagine there's not a single cloud. Imagine it's crystal clear. And it is complete darkness. Okay? Suppose Fajr comes in uh, in, our, in our watches, let's say, at, let's say... Uh, 5.30 let's say, okay? Suppose you're in the middle of the night, 3 a.m. will be pitch dark. What will happen as the sun is coming close to the horizon? The first thing you're going to see is a beam straight up. That's the first ray that will come out, okay? That beam will then begin to gradually get bigger and bigger and bigger until the beam is completely horizontal i.e. it is touching the horizon. Clear? Okay. So, this beam that will come out, the first light that you see from the sun, this is Al-Fajr Al-Kathib, the lying Fajr. Why is it lying? Because people who haven't studied fiqh will think that's Fajr timing. That's not Fajr timing. That's Al-Fajr Al-Awwal. That's Al-Fajr Al-Kathib. What is it? Al-Fajr Al-Thani? What is Al-Fajr Al-Sadiq? When that beam reaches the entire horizon. Okay? When you see the, 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 the beam reach the whole horizon, that is the crack of dawn. That is actual Fajr. And that is when you can pray Salat Al-Fajr until the disk of the sun begins to rise. And as soon as you see the disk, khalas, Fajr is finished. Are you guys clear on this point? Okay, so he is saying وَوَقْتُ الْعِشَاءَ مِنْ ذَلِكَ إِلَى نِصْفِ اللَّيْلِ The timing of Isha is from that, meaning Maghrib, until the middle of the night, 
ثم يبقى وقت الضرورة إلى طلوع الفجر الثاني then after the middle of the night begins the ضرورة timing until the coming of the second fajr so we learn then that isha is like asr in that it also has waqt al ikhtiyar and waqt al darura okay so the only two salawats that have waqt al ikhtiyar and waqt al darura are isha and asr these are the only two salawat all the other salah have one block but isha and asr are the only two that have waqt al ikhtiyari and وقت الضروري okay. So what is وقت الاختيار of عشاء ووقت العشاء من ذلك إلى نصف الليل So the وقت of عشاء is there until the نصف or the middle of the night And where did he get the نصف الليل Straight from the hadith of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said ووقت العشاء إلى نصف الليل الأوسط And the timing of عشاء is until the middle of the night what is the middle of the night? The middle of the night is the night between Maghrib and Fajr. It is not midnight on the watch 12 o'clock. That is irrelevant to the Sharia. Ah. The 12 o'clock is completely irrelevant to the Sharia. Ah. It has nothing to do with the Sharia. Ah. The midnight of our watches is irrelevant. What is the middle of the night? You look at Fajr, you look at Isha, and then you go Sorry, sorry, Maghrib. And you look at Isha, and then you go the middle. So, uh, let us do our, uh, for today, let us go back to today, and let us see, for example, uh, what time is, uh, what time is Maghrib? It's 7.16 p.m. Okay, Maghrib is 7.16 p.m., and Fajr is 5.26 a.m., according to, according to uh, the calendar that we're using. So then, this gives us how many hours in between? 10 hours and... 10 hours and 10 minutes, okay? So this means 5 hours and 5 minutes will be half of the night. So 7, 16, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 16. So 12, 21. 12, 21 will be the middle of the night. Is that clear? Or you want me to do it again? Right? So whatever is Fajr, whatever is Maghrib, whatever is Fajr, that you do the half of it. Okay? And when you do the half of it, that is the end timing of Isha. So Isha today will finish at 12.21 a.m. And if we delay Isha beyond 12.21 without a haja, a darura, without a valid reason, then we will, be, we will incur some sin, but the, but the Isha will still be valid. Waqt al-darura. Okay? And unfortunately, many of us all too often are lazy in this regard. And we delay Isha beyond the waqt of ikhtiyar to the waqt of darura without having a darura. Okay? And we need to be cognizant because the hadith explicitly says, وَوَقْتُ الْعِشَى إِلَى نِصْفَ اللَّيْلِ الْأَوْسَطِ He explicitly said this, the Prophet ﷺ, and that is why some scholars of the past were very strict on this point, and they even said, there is no waqt of darura of Isha. So Isha for those madhahib and scholars would be like fajr. That once the time finishes, the time finishes. And there is a gap between Fajr and Dhuhr where there is no Salah. Otherwise, Dhuhr, Asr, Asr, Maghrib, they have con continuum. For the other Madahib, most of the Madahib, Isha and Fajr also has the continuum. It continues until Fajr. But there is a position that says, no, Isha from beginning to end and that's it. So half the night you cannot pray Isha. And if you pray it, it's like praying Fajr after sunrise. That position exists, but Alhamdulillah is the minority opinion. The majority opinion says that Isha has waqt al darura which means if you pray it at that time, you will get the, you have technically caught Isha, but you will not get the full ajr. You might get some sin, but you will not get the sin of, of not praying Isha. You will not get the sin of not praying uh, Isha. So, uh, this is the uh, the waqt of Isha al-Akhir. Now there are other opinions as well. We don't want to get into that. Some opinions say that the waqt al-Isha is until the third of the night, thuluth al-Layl. Okay. In which case you will divide you will divide uh, Maghrib to Fajr into thirds. So in our scenario, you would have what three hours and twenty minutes, right? So in that case, so eight, nine, ten 
So 1040 today would be the end of Isha. Think about it. If you followed uh, that position. So one of the madhab says, uh, Isha is one third of the night. But the Hanbali madhab says, middle of the night. Alhamdulillah, make it easier. And in fact, this is the stronger opinion because it's coming straight from the hadith. It's coming straight from the hadith that the, the Prophet said uh, that وَقْتُ صَلَاةِ الْعِشَاءِ إِلَىٰ نِصْفِ اللَّيْلِ الْأَوْسَطِ And uh, in the hadith of Jibreel, by the way, it mentions and he prayed Isha when the third of the night had passed. And that's where some of the madhahib say Isha finishes at the third of the night because it's coming from the other hadith of Jibreel. But we say, we meaning the Hanbalis say, that when you have two numbers, one of them incorporates both. We go with the larger number because half incorporates one third. Whereas one third does not incorporate half. So the fact that he says you can pray until half and the fact that he prayed at one third, which number can accommodate both opinions? The half. So that's why the Hanbali Madhab went with the larger number. Okay? Because it can incorporate both of them. So, وَقْتُ صَلَاةِ الْعِشَى إِلَىٰ نِصْفِ اللَّيْلِ فَيَا ذُلِّي وَيَا خَجَلِي إِذَا مَا قَالَ لِي رَبِّي أَمَا اسْتَحِيَيْتَهْ تَعْصِينِي ولا تخشى من العتب وتخفي الذنب عن خلقي وتأبى في الهوى قربي فتب مما جنيت عسى تعود إلى رياضي